everyone, and thank you so much for joining us in this February 9th meeting of the Old Astoria Neighborhood Association. We have a great lineup tonight. Can't wait to get started. Um, we have joining us our new council member, Tiffany Caban, which will be first up. After that, our old council member, because we have to keep bookends going, uh, is Costa Constantinidis discussing Variety Boys and Girls Club. Then we're privileged to have the uh, Champlain Power Express with uh, both transmission developers who will discuss the route that the transmission lines will take through Astoria and also Hydro-Quebec who will give us some information on how this uh, energy is actually um, with the source, uh, how it's provided this hydroelectric power um, that should help our asthma alley issues quite a bit. And then after that, we're going to have the New York uh, Power Authority, the state agency that controls different power, to give us an overview on different projects that are happening in the area. So it should be an interesting meeting, and we're glad everyone can uh, join us. I'd like to start off with a few, with a little bit of news. Um, we have, first of all, a couple new members on our board. We're privileged to have Claudia Koger, um, the previous um, tenant manager at the Astoria Houses. She's joining us as an advisory board member, and we really appreciate having her. It's great to have her experience and wisdom. It's going to help us and guide us in so many ways. So we thank you so much. She's been an institution on um, in Old Astoria and on Hallett's Peninsula, and we're so thankful to have her. Also, Bishop Mitchell Taylor will be joining us on the executive committee, um, and he brings a lot of expertise in nonprofits and running. And he's also, again, a son of um, the Astoria Waterfront, and we really look forward to having him join us also. And there will be other changes coming up soon in the future, but uh, we just wanted to give you these two that we can uh, discuss now. Oh, there is one more. I'm sorry. There will be also Jeffrey Martin, who's a landscape architect, and he will be joining us on the executive committee also. So we're looking forward to lots of interesting changes coming up this year. Wanted to mention a couple of things that happened um, over the last, uh, since our last meeting in November. Um, first of all, uh, DOT approved four-way stops at 29th Street and four, or 14th Street and 29th Avenue. Uh, this is, again, another facet in the school safety uh, uh, net that we're trying to put around PS 171. So this is now effective, and it should do a lot towards uh, creating a safer uh, transit between story houses and PS 171. Our kids are our biggest asset, and we must protect them. Also, as you know, the last two months, we did not have a meeting. We basically directed people to go to the uh, New York City DOT public hearings on 21st Street bus lane that's being proposed. We did, in fact, um, have a survey, which was quite successful. We had almost 700 responses. And if you would like to see the results of our survey, um, it's being put in the chat now, so I hope you have a chance to check it out. It has links to different aspects of what we're dealing with. This is a very important subject. The 21st Street is the artery through, that feeds all of uh, the waterfront area here. And um, whatever changes are made there will affect greatly our quality of life. So we do hope that you check, check this out. There will be more meetings coming up. Uh, we'll be keeping you abreast as as to them, we are discussing our findings with the DOT. We'll see how that goes. And again, we will keep you updated as to what's going on. So that's a couple of subjects that are of, of interest for us. Um, but I'd like to get right into the meeting. We have a full schedule. So I'd like to um, introduce our new council member, Tiffany Caban. A resident of Astoria was born in Richmond Hill, Queens, to parents who grew up in the Woodside Houses. Uh, before joining the New York City Council, Tiffany worked as a public defender, and throughout her professional career, she's used the law to help New York City's most vulnerable communities, and her experiences advocating on behalf of her clients 
helped her identify some of the worst inequities in our criminal justice system. She ran for city council to build a safer and more equitable District 22 and is looking forward to being a citywide champion for real public safety, climate justice, and workers' rights. In addition to her bold policy ideas, as she said in her inauguration speech in December, she's looking forward to getting the trash picked up, trimming the trees, and filling all those potholes. Please welcome our new city council member, Tiffany Caban. Hey, all, and, and Richard, thank you for creating the space. I'm excited to be in conversation with all of you. Um, just want to start by saying good evening, happy belated Lunar New Year, happy Black History Month. Um, and, you know, to add to, to I guess, the, the prof professional CV to share a little bit personally about myself, um, you know, I'm a Queens kid. I uh, was born and raised in, in Queens. I'm a proud dog mom. I'm mostly bringing that up because you might hear them at some point. I apologize. Uh, also a Little League coach, uh, Costa, who's going to be on later. We coach a, a Little League team together at Elm Jack. Um, and, you know, I'm, I'm going to try to be brief in some of the updates because I, I really want to create the space for, for conversation. I know you all have a, a, a long agenda this evening, and I want to be respectful of that as, as well. So I got um, a little bit of a, a head start. I was sworn in a little over two months ago on December 1st, uh, earlier than a lot of other folks coming in because of the, the vacancy. Um, and so immediately after being sworn in, I signed on to co-sponsor over 20 pieces of legislation. Uh, that you know really believed would improve the lives of New Yorkers across all five boroughs. A couple of those passed, right? Um, our city, our, our vote passed. Um, you know there were some bills around uh, uh, pay transparency that passed, some good stuff in there. Um, and it, recently, I learned about my committee assignments. So I'm excited to announce that I am the chair for the Women and Gender Equity Committee, and will be a, a member of the committees for general welfare, civil service and labor, mental health, disabilities and addictions, public safety and small business services. I'm really excited to be sitting on each and every one of those. Um, and we have our first public hearing coming up for my committee, the, the Women and Gender Equity Committee. And, and the, the topic of that, the subject that we will be really focusing on is making sure and learning more about how we can expand access to services, all kinds of supportive services for survivors and victims of domestic violence and, and gender-based violence. Um, and so we can uh, you know, share more information about that as the, the, the hearing starts being planned and coming together. Um, since being sworn in, we have, our team has been on the ground. I know at some point during this, this meeting, uh, all of our office's contact information will be there and readily available. Really encourage y'all to engage uh, and reach out when you have any questions, concerns, ideas, suggestions. Um, but we have been running around the district, would love to share just a little bit of, of what our team has been working on. Um, you know, we're, we're, we wanna make sure that we are filling the big shoes that Costa met. And then also like really quite intentionally building uh, on the things that he did to, to really maximize impact in the community. And I'm really grateful to, to, to say and share that, you know, the, the relationship there is one that not every incoming council member has. It's nice to be able to meet with Costa on a, a, a regular basis and talk shop over, you know, breakfasts and lunch and, and, and things like that. And, um, you know, that has been incredibly helpful as as we have uh, you know come together to, to take on this role so during january we reached out to every single public school in the district asking what they needed how you know how could we help we visited a number of the schools in the district uh, delivered COVID home testing kits and um, over 500 k95 masks i listened to teachers and school administrators talk about the struggles that they've been facing during this recent omicron surge the lack of testing available the jump in student absences um you know and the challenge of facing the constant changes brought on by by the pandemic and actually earlier today was at long island city high school celebrating their uh, opening of, of the food pantry um, in conjunction with zone 126 which i know so many of y'all are are familiar with um, we're also working with our other colleagues in government so we were successful in getting additional test sites open, including the one at the Variety Boys and Girls Club to help expand access uh, to testing during the height of the, the surge. And full disclosure, right? You know, we were putting a lot of pressure on the city in terms of expanding testing capacity because ideal in an ideal world, right? Like the city would be would be the one to to take on all of it. But we found that 
that the capacity wasn't there. And so we had to make, you know, enter partnerships with private companies. And so we know that there were issues with, um, you know, test results, uh, not coming back quick enough and things like that. So we worked hard to try to stay on top of those things to the degree that, that we could. Um, we have also met with countless local organizations that are interested in receiving city council expense funding. It's been really, really wonderful to learn more about all the critical work that our, our local CBOs are doing and help uh, help them navigate the, the funding application process. And by the way, the deadline for submitting an application for funding is February 22nd. So February 22nd, make sure you get that in. Uh, and we've also been prioritizing building relationships with agency partners. Myself and my team have met with the executive teams at the Parks Department, um, DOT, NYCHA, Sanitation, DOE, uh, DOB, and, and others. And we've wasted no time asking for them to help our district, requesting additional trash cans and more consistent trash pickup, advocating for better snow removal services, uh, minimizing disruptions and outages, specifically at, at Astoria Houses, um, and identifying areas for capital improvements in our parks. Um, having clear and open lines of communication with our agency partners and the mayor's office have allowed us to, to really more quickly be able to troubleshoot some of those constituent problems and, and get better results for, for folks in, in the district. So that's been good. Um, excited to announce the return of participatory budgeting. Our office <laughs> is... Matt, relax. <laughs> well, give me one moment. Um, they only stay so quiet during these Zooms for so long. It's been a very long day. Um, sorry about that, y'all. So yes, participatory budgeting, our office has allocated 1 million uh, that can be used for physical infrastructure projects, and then an additional 50,000 in discretionary expense funding. So while the, the, the idea submission period has ended and we, we got a ton of great submissions, um, we are hosting and have started hosting multiple volunteer-led meetings um, every week, and that will continue. And so folks who are interested in joining our volunteer team to help decide how PV funds are, are spent should reach out to us. Um, and then lastly, oh, and also in addition to that, right, not just adults in the neighborhood, we have a participatory budgeting youth council. And so if you have a child or a family member uh, that is at, at least I, I think it's at least 13 or 14 years old, they can participate and have a say in this. And we're partnering with the schools to make sure that, that students and, and uh, parents are engaged in this process as well. Um, and then lastly, our team is, is gonna be announcing really soon a series of regular public listening sessions, starting with Astoria Houses, where we'll talk um, with constituents about their concerns and priorities and learn how our office can be a better service. And so stay tuned for sort of like a regular coffee with Kaban event series. Um, I wanna make sure that I am available to, to y'all um, for conversations and these engagement strategies are gonna ensure that our office always has an ear to the ground and that people always know how to reach me, how to, how to reach our, our staff members. Um, and, and also I will say, unfortunately our district office is still currently under construction, we're, but we are so close. We're gonna be opening really, really soon. It's close to the old office, um, this, it, and it's a storefront on 31st Street. It was put under construction to make it ADA accessible. Uh, and we're planning on welcoming constituents into the office with an office opening party. Uh, even without a, a district office, though, we are accessible. And so if you need to reach us, please email district22 at council.nyc.gov. And, and again, this stuff is going to be dropped into the, the, the chat at some point, or call 718 274 Four five zero zero. We are here to help you with problems big and small. Um, and you know, I, I certainly appreciate that this is a local office. And in addition to citywide legislative and budget priorities uh, that I plan to champion, our team is is going to doggedly fight for local improvements to make our district safer, cleaner, greener, and and more livable. Um, and I also sent Richard, a, a, I sent you Richard, a, a list of our, our staff and the, their portfolio. So you have an idea of who to contact on those specific issues. Uh, and, you know, I'd love to discuss everything else we've been up to, but I know this is going to be a long meeting and I, I want to be respectful of, of folks' uh, time. So, you know, happy, uh, happy to, to take some questions. Yes. Let me mention one thing, which I failed to do before. And, and thank you, Tiffany. Um, 
If you have a question, okay, just type it into the chat in Facebook or in YouTube, however you're viewing the stream, and it will come up here and we'll be able to, um, you know, ask that question. So this is how you reach out to us. So uh, if you have questions, please put them in. Um, while we're waiting for a question, um, <clears throat> I have a couple that I'd like to throw at you. One's a, a sort of a different one. You, and listen, if there's anything here that you really don't, you know, have a response to at this point, please just, you know, get back to us when you can do your research. Yeah. Richard, you know, I have never been shy about saying, I know what I, no, know, that's I, know true. What I don't know. Yeah. And you know, that's always important better. because <clears throat> hopefully, uh, Becoming a politician won't change that for you. <laughs> okay. Here's uh, one question I have. Um, um, as you know, the governor has a proposed Interborough Express, which we're all very excited about. We really need um, decent public transportation uh, that does not touch on Manhattan. However, it's not being extended to your district, to Astoria. This particular project will be ending in Jackson Heights. The reason behind this is that the MTA controls the traffic, the track uh, from Brooklyn on up to Jackson Heights, but Amtrak controls the track from Jackson Heights and beyond, and even into the Bronx. While we understand there are also some additional operational issues because of the Hell's Gate Bridge, I really think that it's important that you start to do everything you can, and hopefully in conjunction with our Congresswoman, because Amtrak is federal, um, to um, be able to extend that service into um, Astoria, uh, particularly around the Demars area, which was what was original projection from the regional planning service. So um, I wonder if you have any comments on that. Yeah, so I, you know, I, along with a, a, a number of elected officials, um, you know, here in Queens and, and the other, you know, the impacted areas in, in the Bronx, um, recently sat in our briefing to learn more uh, about the project. And so just beginning stages of getting a lot of the information. And so the next steps are, you know, planning conversations with our colleagues at every level of government, and also having conversations with you know, our, our transit allies um, and other folks that can give us, uh, you know, better context around infrastructure implications um, and talking to folks here, obviously, uh, about the desire to, to, to be able to advocate to ex extend further, but certainly still in the information gathering um, part of the process, because we literally just had that briefing, I think it was maybe a week ago. Mm -hmm. Good. Yeah. Yeah. I think I saw the briefing about a week and a half ago too. Yeah, so, yeah. and I'm I'm with you in terms of con like continuing to <coughs> invest in public transit and also I mean we all hear how, story. how horrific it is trying to get from <laughs> our neck of the wood in Queens down to, yep. to Brooklyn. Yeah, you shouldn't mm -hmm. have to travel into Manhattan to do it. Mm -hmm. Okay, we have questions coming through now on the chat too. Um, let me start with let me see. Jeff Martin says hi, Tiffany. Thanks for joining. Two big picture items and one short-term concern. What's your position on the future of Rikers Island? Now you behind the feasibility study and possibility of a renewable Rikers. Yes, absolutely. So um, just for context for folks too, there are some updates on that front. Um, when Costa was still in office, he championed the Renewable Rikers Act uh, and um, it resulted in the ordering of these environmental impact studies, as well as transferring land from DOC to DCAS so that um, the parcels of land could not be used for correctional uh, purposes. And, um, you know, the idea was to be able to, to take that land and turn it into uh, a renewable energy island. And this is the intersection of all of the things that I really deeply care about. Um, you know, it, on, a, on a larger scale, right, to just sort of frame the conversation, we know that environmental justice is racial justice. We know that the communities that are most acutely impacted by the climate crisis, my dog is sick, so you're going to hear him coughing in the background, um, acutely affected by the, the climate crisis are uh, frontline black and brown lower income communities. Um, and then obviously here, we know that we are in, in Asthma Alley. You know, my mom grew up in the area and like lots of folks here is, is a, a, a chronic asthmatic. Um, and, you know, we know that's because of, of all of the, you know, the power plants and, and things that we have right in, in our neck of the woods. Um, so 
we know we have to, there's a humanitarian crisis on, on Rikers Island. We have, you know, tons of folks saying that it is unsafe. It can't be made safe. Um, we have to find different solutions. And there has been a plan in place to close Rikers. Now, it's a whole nother issue, the fact that in order to stay on the previous mayor's timeline, um, we have to do more about the census because the census on the island was going down and we've seen it it um, rise during the, 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 the pandemic. And so that's a problem. Um, and a lot of that could be alleviated by proper public health infrastructure, right? Like uh, permanent housing for unhoused folks, access to mental health care um, and lots of other things like, like that. Because unfortunately right now, and Rikers Island is a jail, not a prison. And there's a, there's a very big distinction between the, the two and who's housed uh, in those separate facilities. Um, you know, right now we're we're really lacking on on that front. Um, if we turn it into a renewable energy island, um, we would have the ability to get rid of every single dirty, polluting, fracked gas peaker plant, not just in our our district, but across the entire city. And so that would go a really it would not solve all of our energy and and climate problems, but it is like a key piece to the couple uh, to the puzzle when we combine it with. Um, you know, mitigation and resiliency plans. And um, when we combine it with uh, things like compost, composting to, to help with green, greenhouse gas emissions, all those different things, it'll go a really, really long way. So in support of that, um, we are currently following up with both DCAS um, and, and asking about the progress on the environmental impact studies. Uh, my office has requested a, a walkthrough to see the parcels of land that has been transferred over because in, in my opinion, um, if these pieces of part of the island have already been transferred and jails can no longer exist on those parts of the island and they currently are not there, um, then there's no reason why we, we shouldn't be able to put some pressure on it and start building and start building out some of that renewable energy. I mean, in my opinion, the sooner the better. Thank you. Good. Um, next question. And this you don't necessarily have to answer because it's not in your district. OK, but uh, from Lynn Kennedy, nice to hear about what you're up to. Um, I was wondering if you could share your opinion on the Queen's Innovation Project that's been proposed. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's not it, in your district. yeah, I mean, it's clear it's not in the district, but it is clearly one that's going to affect people that, that live in the district. Um, I will be really honest. We have been digging into the, the land use applications um, and and projects within the district much more in, you know, intentionally and putting our attention there. For folks who don't know, when I took office in December, I literally had to vote on a, a, a rezoning three days later. And so there was a you know, a lot of things that we had to catch up on. And when I said very humbly, Richard, that I, I readily say what I know and I don't know, um, land use and rezonings admittedly is not my bread and butter. It's not my area of expertise. And so there's gone a lot, there's been a lot of effort uh, on my part, my team's part to make sure um, that I am learning as, as quickly as possible and talking to a lot of folks uh, about these processes. Um, so we'll start, you know, having conversations with the, the council member whose district it is in with, with council member Julie Wan. Uh, but admittedly, I do not know much about the project yet. We have been focused on learning more about some of the other projects on the peninsula that are, that are coming down the pipeline. Well, you know, it's fascinating stuff. As you know, I've got over 20 years on the land use committee here. So if you have any questions, please ask <laughs> from my perspective. Absolutely. Anyways, also uh, from Jonathan, Jonathan Forgash, asking a green market and a story would be great for the community. I know they personally, myself, I know they've been proposed a number of times. The last time we proposed one was in the sitting area by Astoria Park and Hoyt Avenue North across from Chapetto Park. Um, there is an area there that's empty that we're looking at some other uses during the pandemic um, to keep it as a sitting area and to green it. But that was going to be done by um, volunteer work with no funding from parks. And I haven't heard anything about that, but that mm. would be an interesting spot to put a green market. Yeah, I mean, I, I love the idea of expanding access to green markets. Um, you know, I would often go to the sunny side 
uh, green market to, to go to and, and check out a market. Um, this is actually a conversation that I've had with Jonathan before, so I'm glad he, he brought it up. We did get some um, requests on the participatory budgeting side uh, as it relates to, to green markets. Um, and also, you know, one thing that Jonathan did bring up that I've really taken to heart too is that in terms of expansion, really doing our due diligence and in, in finding um, and identifying a location that has a very high need in, in terms of, you know, making sure that it's situated uh, in, in an area that is a little bit of a, a, a food desert so that, you know, we're filling, we're filling some gaps with those efforts. Okay. Um, next. Sorry, I'm trying to, somebody, Costa can't get in, so I'm going to send him a number. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, Okay. Uh, are there any plans to deal with New York City's growing rat problem? Ooh. Um, I mean, yeah, the, the, we've, we've got work to do. Uh, you know, I will say that the, the sanitation's budget has been cut in, in recent years. And so, you know, I'm in favor of raising the, the budget and I'm in favor of hiring, hiring more sanitation workers and increasing service. Um, you know, just today, uh, a constituent reached out and our team asked the sanitation department for more trash cans in the upper Dittmars area from, from Steinway to, to Hazen. Um, and, you know, we, like I mentioned before, uh, have a few sanitation related projects submitted via, via participatory budgeting, which I think is, is very excited. Uh, and personally, I'm in favor of citywide containerized trash systems. There's, there's currently a clean curbs pilot program in some commercial corridors of the city. And that's something that would keep household and business trash in, in protected bins, which would limit um, not just spillage, but, but rats. Um, so those are some of the things that we're looking at. And we found some interesting stuff that we've advocated for along those lines, particularly in the parks. Um, a lot of federal parks now no longer have trash receptacles within the park facility. It's uh, carry, it, carry your food in, carry your garbage out. But they are providing dumpsters and containers outside the park perimeter for people to dump their stuff in. You can't expect them necessarily to walk and take care, carry it all home. But this greatly simplifies control of the garbage. Yeah. So, And the one thing I will add, too, is that I'm actually very excited about my colleague, Sandy Nurse, in, in um who serves out in the Bushwick area, um, who is now the chair of, of sanitation. And she has just been a, I don't know if this is the right way to put it, but she, like, she has been a, you know, a sanitation nerd for a very long time. She's the founder of um, an organization called BK Rot uh, that does you know, composting um, work and, and, and waste management stuff. And so I, I think that we should all be pretty excited to have her you know, leading that committee. And I think she'll do some good work on that front too. From Jeff Martin again, second big picture, Asma Alley, what is your take on Big Alice and the generating station on 20, 20th Avenue, and what can we do to get involved to transition to clean power? This is actually a great subject. It will also be addressed later in this meeting, but yeah. uh, please take it. Yeah, I mean, so, you know, some of this stuff is is obviously making sure that we are partners and working with our, our colleagues at every level of government. We should be supporting, for example, at the state level, the, the Build Public Renewables Act, right? Um, you know, and, and it's not just something that will help us with cleaner air, but it's also part of the economic recovery that we need. If we're building out um, green energy infrastructure, that means we're creating jobs, not just for the construction, but for the maintenance, good green union um, jobs at, at that. Uh, and so, you know, that's a, a, a really big thing. I think something also that would facilitate these kinds of projects and it starts at the state level, but the city has a role to play is, is, um, you know, being in support of a, a, a public bank um, that can help, you know, finance these, these projects and prioritize them. Um, so, you know, I, I think those are some of the things, but we absolutely have to, to move away from, you know, frac nat natural uh, gas and, and move over to, you know, wind, solar, uh, battery power um, type stuff. And then I know that we'll be hearing also about the, the or y'all will be, I've been in several meetings on this, hearing about the, um, the project, the hydropower project that is uh, coming to, to our district. Okay, also, um... Small picture from Jeff again. Uh, can you support us to push to open up the Shore Tower waterfront public space? Um, yes. Okay. So I will say this is something that our office 
has been excited to work on. We have taken it very, very seriously from, from day one. Uh, I'm just going to put it very plainly. I think that Shore Towers has been a bad actor who hasn't kept good on their commitment to keep the Greenway public and accessible. Um, and so the Department of Buildings is in charge of the, the building certificate of occupancy. Um, they're in charge of conducting inspections and issuing violations. Um, but the Department of City Planning is in charge of the, the Greenway itself. Uh, so our office is now working very closely with, um, one moment, I'm sorry. So our office is, is working uh, very closely at this point with DOB and DCP who are, are now conducting routine inspections. And so the DCP in particular is, is actually advocating for com complete removal of the gate, which they don't believe is lawful. Um, and of beautification efforts on the Greenway, which were originally required of the building owners and were never done. I mean, if, if you walk through there, right, like there is no, um, there's no greenery there. Uh, and that was the, the in, initial uh, intention and agreement. So the building owners have um, an oath and Office of Administrative Trials and Hearings uh, hearing on March 1st, where the violations that they've racked up from the Department of Building Inspections are going to be reviewed um, and a remedy put into place. And so I get my ask for, for y'all actually to help us with this is that we are urging pedestrians and cyclists to take this month ahead of, of the March 1st meeting to record 311 complaints every time they witness the gates closed, as well as to, to and I, I also would ask that you tag our office on social media so that we're aware of it, um, because showing a clear pattern of disregard is going to be really important over the next month. And so we're we're really hopeful that given their their pattern of poor behavior and and the DOBs and DCPs support for full removal of, of the gate, that the March 1st hearing and resulting actions will be the end of, of this debacle. Um, but like we are not and if it's not, we're not stopping. Like this is something that we have really taken on uh, with with a lot of, of of energy. And this is an issue that we we hear folks on and we care a lot about. Okay, good. Um, and uh, let me see. Hold on a second. Still trying to get Costa in here. Okay. Well, anyways, listen, Jonathan, Jeff, everybody's appreciating what you're doing. Um, it's not been. I'm reading through. Okay, from Neil Hurden. Um, your vision for parks and green spaces particularly the smaller parks and funding, I guess. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, I mean, right now we're we're doing an assessment. Like I said, we've met with the department, um, with the, the parks department. For example, recently we did a walk through um, in the, the, the Hoyt Avenue um, playground. I wanna make sure that we invest a, a, a bit there and they were able to identify some areas. And also in conjunction with that um, for the, the project, across the street that um, that was approved. Like I said, I had to vote on it. The ninth, the, you know, the, it wasn't even the ninth inning of the project. It was the last out of the ninth inning, three days after being in office. But in those few days, we were able to get an additional $250,000 commitment um, to be invested back, to be invested into that park. So that's definitely something that's going to be happening there. Um, but we are doing an assessment of all of the parks in, in the district, getting recommendations on um, you know what what improvement projects uh, you know could be prioritized, um, and then obviously also there were things submitted through participatory budgeting that that folks will be able to to vote on and consider as well. Okay, from Lynn Kennedy again. Schools in our district are are not composting yet. Cafeteria composting, and that the city picks up. Can we get our district on board with this mission and more green? Yeah, I am. I'm, I mean, I'm a full supporter of, of composting. I want to make, you know, I would like everybody, every one of our residents in, you know, in the, the district composting. And I, th I think that also necessitates the city building out the infrastructure that makes it easy for folks to compost. Right. Um, and so I, I absolutely agree with you. Uh, you know, I, I think I want to acknowledge that, you know, right now s schools are really struggling um, with a, a lot of different things ranging from, you know, the, 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 the social emotional health of their students to, 
um, you know, testing and pandemic issues to d d digital divide issues to a lots of uh, different things. And so I know that, um, you know, it's something that I want to make sure that we're pursuing and advocating. I also uh, just want to be really mindful. And it doesn't mean that we don't push for it, that we don't try to get these things done. Um, but just also want to be like really transparent about how, you know, schools and administrations are, um, you know, prioritizing certain things in, in a manner in which they're a little bit in survival mode, right? Like, you know, ventilation systems are, are taking a high priority, um, PPE and, 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 you know, figuring out how to, how to safely um, have kids in school and the lessons and stuff like that. And it's still something that uh, has, has continued to be a, a challenge. And so I'm really hoping that you know, uh, the worst is is behind us. That we're building out some good systems, and that we can really get back to the work of um, you know advancing all of the the green aspects that we should be incorporating into our schools. Because I, I certainly support um, the, the the Green New Deal for public schools. Uh, you know, uh, Congressman Jamal Bowman has been a, a really great advocate on on that, and it really focuses on things like composting, like, you know, replacing windows uh, on, um, you know, replacing air ventilation systems and all of those kinds of things. Thank you. Uh, from Antonella Di Savario, as we move towards renewables, we need to make sure that the rates are affordable. People who are transitioning to electric for heat are seeing a sticker shock, I think she means. What can be done about this? And I, as a matter of fact, am aware of this too. Right now, the numbers just don't work. So... It's very difficult. Yeah, um, you know what I'm gonna say. I'd like to to get back uh, to to you on this, Antonella, um, until I I feel a little bit more equipped to to answer your question about um, about rates. Although, if if people are interested in in uh, learning and getting an update on some of the things I've learned from from Con Ed in the, the past couple of days, I can certainly do that. But I'd like to get back to you on this question. Thank you. Okay. Well, and actually, maybe, can I just ask for clarification, Antonella? Would you also like me to talk a little bit about like the the, the rate hikes that that people are experiencing right now, where where their bills are like doubling and, and tripling? I'm sure you can. Um, yeah, yeah. I mean, first, I want to say yeah, that. As I a matter of, let me just interject yeah. one thing. I got a call from our treasurer, um, who manages a couple of buildings in our area, and one of the tenants in that building for the for the month last month. Got a bill of fourteen thousand dollars. Oh my god! So, oh my god! To, yeah, you know, um, there are big issues out yeah. there, and the bills are going up everywhere. It, I mean, it's 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 really horrific. Um, and also, like, what a gut punch! If, <laughs> I mean, so many of us, like, you know, to to get a, a bill like that, um, is, is can be pretty devastating. Um, so I want to share that that we've been hearing, we have been hearing from constituents about that in particular, and, and we've been trying to work a, a few different avenues. Um, and what I have come to, to learn is that the problem here is, is mostly due to, to market forces, right? So the, the, rent, the recent price hikes are due to what's called the, the supply side costs. And Con Ed is, is basically only partly to blame because they don't control the supply side rates um, or the energy costs like writ large. Uh, and there is a public service commission that, that is tasked with re regulating those rates. And so, um, if, if Costa is in here, I would encourage him to jump in because I'm sure he's got things to add there. He's, you know, he's, uh, uh, he, he knows his stuff on that front. But, but also that, like, that's why renewable energy, which is much less volatile in the markets, is the way forward, right? It, it's um, especially as a, a publicly owned utility system. And so for folks who are worried about a high bill, also, there's, uh, there's a few options. You, you can check out the Home Energy Assistance Program that's run by New York State for low-income uh, New Yorkers. You can work with Con Ed on a payment plan and you can file a complaint with the Public Service Commission and also just would encourage you to, to feel free to reach out to our office with any specific concerns. I just want to mention to people again, if you answer, if your question doesn't get answered because we are getting a little tight on time, we have five minutes left, um, we will forward the question to the Congress uh, member and or the council member. I just promoted you. <laughs> and uh, um, and we'll get a response and we'll send it out on social media. Um, from Jonathan uh, Forgash, uh, we did a walk through Astoria after Ida and saw the flooding damage to businesses, what's being done to prep the streets and storm sewers for the next big storm. And also, I would like to add to that, what is your position on uh, 
the um, outdoor dining facilities. Uh, should there be sta minimum standards um, in terms of uh, safety and visuals? And also, I just wanted to let you know, I got a lot of calls from local businesses that are restaurants that want them removed. And their reasoning is they said they're losing customers because of the lack of parking. People are not coming in. They're not coming to their restaurants because there's no parking. And so it's not necessarily 100%. Uh, restaurants are not 100% at all in favor of this. So Nothing is ever 100%. Comments on that? <laughs> yeah, nothing's ever 100%, I think. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, Jonathan, uh, I, and, and obviously, I think there there are these really big problems that we have to deal with, right? And part of it is our, our systemic. So, for example, after, um, you know, after any superstorm, like it, to give Sandy as an example um, uh, on for, you know, for the in Astoria houses, right? Like, it's just such a, a reactive process. Uh, and that, like, even now, FEMA is, is only contracted to do fixes on the, the buildings were effective, that were affected, when the reality is, is that, like, the next storm is coming, and it's, it's like playing Russian roulette with buildings, and, like, why not retrofit everything and get it to where it needs to be to keep people safe, and that's, like, a, a whole issue unto, unto itself. I know that we went together um, to visit lots of, of businesses whose, uh, you know, whose properties uh, were, were flooded, particularly their, their basement areas. Um, so, you know, that is a, another sort of like, again, sanitation issue to a degree in terms of expanding uh, capacity to make sure that there are enough people out there clearing out those storm drains um, and things like that for, for the next big storm. There's a lot of, there's, I mean, there are a lot more things that, that have to, to get done. Um, and Richard on the, you know, the, the open dining, um, you know, I think that we have been meeting with different business councils and small business um, owners in the, the neighborhood, hearing their concerns, hearing, you know, what are some of the things they want to see? What are some of the problems? Um, for the most part, you know, it, it, the outdoor dining has been a, the, a, a bit of a lifeline for a lot of these folks. Um, I agree with you that it needs to be as safe as, as humanly possible, but also that we have to look at it at, in a broader sense and, and not just through like these really narrow windows of what it means to create a safe infrastructure, right? Like that also means that we have to pursue safety by making sure that we're changing driver behavior that can sometimes make conditions unsafe. You know, unfortunately we had a, a, a death on uh, Ditmar's um, Avenue not that long ago, right, right outside of uh, Rosadoro. Yeah um uh, into the the outdoor dining structure and and for me that's you know not a reason to not have outdoor dining it, it is a reason to fortify make it safe it's a reason to have some real um you know solutions to to reckless dangerous driving uh and making you know our, our sidewalks and um and business corridors safe for for pedestrians and people who are are dining outdoors um, and then also, I, you know, I have to, I want to look at some of the, the, the transcripts, uh, but my, uh, my colleagues, they recently had a, a nine hour hearing on, on outdoor, um, on outdoor dining. Mm -hmm. um, and so there's a lot to be learned there as well. Okay. All right. I'd like to read one more interesting comment regarding shore towers. And uh, at that point, um, <clears throat> um, it, it actually, and I have a comment to make on that. It says, and this seems like it is coming from a resident, okay, regarding Shore Towers Promenade, if the gate is removed, is there a contingency for safety on the waterfront and the residents? It's dangerous in a dark place. I think the lighting is an issue down there. Will policing be adding better lighting security cast, uh, cameras? It's a pretty dead area. You know, often enough, there's an element that comes up there. Well, whether there is an element or not at this point, I think that the lighting itself is a very, very important issue on our community board. And as you see, we are getting quite a bit of correspondence from them also. I'm glad to have them. Um, one of our, our number one capital request for years has been to improve the lighting around the waterfront and promenade area down there. Uh, not just on Shore Towers, but also on the promenade around um, the ferry and around the uh, story of houses. It's a, yeah. basically non-existent. And yeah. we have been trying and trying and trying and butting our heads up against the wall. Number one request of the community board. So uh, yeah. this is along the same lines. I do think that that whole area in the waterfront needs to have better lighting and it needs to have camera systems and, uh, you know, for everybody's sake. So 
I hope that's something that you can address at some point. Yeah, you know, I, I've been a really vocal um, proponent of of you know trying to of talking with folks about the fact that um, public safety is something that is the product yeah. of a lot of different things being present in our communities, right? Um, and so lighting is a big one, right? When we when I was giving the update on Shore Towers, um, that agreement, that mandate for beautification of that greenway, that that actually creates a safer environment, right? Not just lighting, but when you make it beautiful, when you add um, trees and plants um, and you create the kind of environment that is conducive to it being well lit, to it being a nice space that you wanna take care of, to there being you know consistent traffic um, in and out, like all of those things contribute to better safety outcomes for sure. And so absolutely on board, especially, um, you know, especially with, with adding lighting and things like that, I'm a, a very big supporter of. Yeah. Okay, thank you so very much. I think this is a great first meeting. <clears throat> we hope to have you back. Your predecessor, Costa, was constantly with us all the time as he will be later today. And, uh, um, we wish you the best uh, for the next two years in your, uh, in your term. And uh, if you ever have any needs to reach out to the community, please reach out to us and we'll do everything we can to help you out. This is a mutual uh, help situation. So let's help each other out to do Great. the best for the community. Thank you. Thank you. And anyone yeah, that had questions really here that didn't get them answered, we will forward them to uh, uh, Tiffany. Okay. It's a pleasure to spend time with you all tonight. Thank you so much. Thank you. All right. Bye-bye. Okay, great. Okay, so now um, the other send, the other, that other bookend, Costa Constantinides, is going to join us for a few minutes. He's going to go over Variety Boys and Girls Club and also help us introduce us to the next section of our program. Costa, are you in? I hope. Hey Richard, oh, I'm, I'm okay. waiting for him. No, it's me. Sorry. Okay. I'm waiting for Costa to to join. I think he just joined in now. There he is. Mm -hmm. Good. Hey Richard, oh, I'm, I'm okay. waiting for him. It's me. Sorry. Okay. I'm waiting for Costa to to join. I'm, I'm he here. In now. I'm here. I see you. <laughs> hey Richard, oh, I'm, I'm okay. waiting for him. It's me. Sorry. Okay. Hello, I'm here. I'm waiting for Costa to to join. I'm here. I'm here. Okay, Costa, can you hear me? Yes, I do. Perfect. Okay, great. Okay, Costa, thank you so much for joining us. Um, and, uh, you know, I think that uh, Costa holds the record for the most number of appearances in the OANA monthly meetings. So uh, someday we're going to have to give you a plaque for that. But thank you so you much know, for joining I think us that, again. Uh, Costa holds the record for the most number of appearances in the OANA monthly meetings. So uh, someday we're going to have to give you a plaque for that. Yep. Hey, Costa, this is Victor. You have the stream open behind the... Uh... There you go. Okay. Yeah, shut the YouTube off. YouTube off or something. I, was, I was listening to you guys. You know, I was trying to like keep up with the meeting. I want to know where I was coming in. Perfect. <laughs> so... Yeah, well, Look, I think we're good now. We lost the echo. So great. listen, uh, I'd like you to, uh, everyone, Costa was our, um, our council person for um, seven years, I guess, approximately. Um, and uh, a lot of the initiatives we're going to be talking about today in terms of uh, uh, sustainability uh, were championed by Costa, as M Tiffany mentioned. Um, and um, also now... And there's an institution within our community, a growing institution called Variety Boys and Girls Clubs. And Costa is the executive director now. He's taken on one other wonderful position in public service. We greatly appreciate that. So Costa, if you'd like to go over uh, what's happening with uh, the Boys and Girls Club and any other things you'd like to discuss, uh, please do. Yeah, no, I mean, it's it's great to, to be here back with you, Richard, and, and great to see, well, see everybody and that we're, we're virtual. Uh, but it's uh, and always appreciated ONA, uh, OANA's partnership uh, in my time in the council. And now we get to build on that 
uh, moving forward with the Boys and Girls Club. And there's a lot of really exciting things going on at the Boys and Girls Club right now. And I was really excited to follow uh, my good friend, Tiffany Caban. Um, little no fact, she and I coach Little League together. Uh, she's, she, we coach uh, a team at the uh, Elm Jack Little League together. And uh, Elm, uh, Tiffany is a, a great friend and a great baseball coach and a fellow lover of baseball. So uh, it's always good to see Tiffany. And I'm, I'm really appreciative of the great job that she's doing so far. Um, so I just wanted to you know, give you guys an update. So we're... I think I kind of talked a little bit about at the meeting, I think in June, right? Like way back when it was warm, we weren't wearing winter coats and scarves and hats. Uh, I kind of went over the, the, the expansion of the Boys and Girls Club uh, that we're championing uh, that will bring uh, a renewed Boys and Girls Club, one that will be the first planetarium in Queens, a thousand seat sports arena, a uh, regulation swimming pool, among other amenities. And, one in particular is a STEM lab. And, you know, I'm really excited about this STEM lab because, you know, I'm not, you know, I get to choose the folks I get to work with. And we need, we have an energy revolution happening in our community. You know, we have an opportunity to change what has been historically uh, a polluted community, one that's been dubbed Asthma Alley. It's something I spent a lot of time on in my, in my time in the council. Uh, you know, Big Alice opened in 1963, I believe. Uh, you know, there's I, I said this during my press conference a few weeks ago, but it's really a tale of two Astorias where, you know, Boys, Boys and Girls Club opens in 1955. We've moved on to serve 4,000 kids a year. Um, but many of the kids that we serve have, you know, Robert Moses redlined west of 21st Street. And they put... You know, environmental challenges like the Ravenswood generating or Big Alice at the time in our community adjacent to Old Story and Neighborhood Association, adjacent to public housing at Queensbridge, uh, uh, you know, at Ravenswood, at Ravenswood uh, houses, at the, you know, adjacent to the Astoria houses. And the impact has been asthma rates higher than the Queensboro average, you know, in the zip codes 101, 102, 106. Uh, so, you know, we have a chance to sort of move away from that fossil fuel, traditional uh, polluting energy. And that, you know, that polluting energy, by the way, is the same like, you know, the gas sort of volatility is what's causing a lot of the, uh, you know, sort of issues with our, pro with our, get with our Con Edison bill right now, right? We moved away from Indian Point, which was great. Um, but they kind of left New York City in a place where we didn't have enough renewables built out. And now we're beholden to the gas market for our power. 90% of the city's power now comes from uh, you know, gas-powered power plants. So when gas is in flux, you're going to get increased bills. So we need to be able to move away from that volatility to a future that is renewable. Replace Asthma Alley Renewable Row. And we do that by having partners in our community. Equinor Wind is coming to our neighborhood. They're going to bring over 1,000 megawatts of wind. Just to give you a sense, when I talk about megawatts, right? Uh, New York City every day runs between 8,000 and 11,500 megawatts. So when I talk about bringing 1,000 megawatts, you're talking about like an eighth to an 11th of our entire energy need from one project with Econor Wind. Then you have Clean Path New York, another thousand plus megawatts. So that's, again, we're chipping away at the fossil fuel dependence. You know, we then go, we have another project that's already permitted, permitted by the way, in the Champaign Hudson Power Express that's also gonna plug in. That's, that's Hydro-Quebec that's gonna be speaking later this evening. They're mm -hmm. plugging in in our community. That's another 1,230 megawatts. So. We need to keep chipping away at this, vol this gas volatility, at this dependence on fossil fuel that is literally making our community sick and increasing our asthma rates. So by having this renewable energy plug in here, we go from asthma alley to renewable row. And I'm excited that, that the Champaign Hudson Power Express has already, you know, they've done what needs to be done in our community. They're going to help educate our kids. 
Uh, they're gonna. They just uh, Richard, you were there with us, and I was excited mm -hmm. to have you as part of our press conference. Mm -hmm. That we were able to announce and the coldest the press conference, press conference. Huh? and the coldest <laughs> a Omicron. It was January and yeah. we wanted to keep people safe, but it was really freaking cold. Yeah, how can we say that? <laughs> <laughs> but it was really cold. Mm -hmm. But we know this this investment is going to benefit our kids. They're going to learn about renewable energy. They're gonna, it's it's a one point two five million dollar investment, and every entity who comes in our community should be making investments in our community. They shouldn't just be making money. Hydro-Quebec gets that. And they're going to be making an investment in our kids who should be the future scientists of the 21st century right here from, from Western Queens. Beautiful. Well, thank That's you so much. That's great. That's a great introduction to our next segments that are coming in. Is there anything else? Uh, let me look at something here. Um, well, by the way, um, if you're so much into baseball, um, in order to give back to the Canadians, are you going to somehow reinstitute the Montreal Expos? <laughs> is that a deal? Is that what is that what you're trying to do? Hey, I mean, look, I, 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 you know, I have an Expos hat. I bought one at a Met game, like in 1989. Um, you know, hey. I would love to see the Montreal Expos come back, but I'm, I'm, a, I'm a nostalgic, you know, you know, we were talking today about the old pirate uniform from the, we are family 1979 championship. So like I'm into the, the old time retro baseball stuff. Uh, but look, I think also, I know, you know, we, look, we're building new programs for the boys and girls club. Um, we're going to be you know, constructing our new building starting next year. We're going to be having many partners as part of this building, um, but we're excited about the future, excited about going from serving 4,000 kids to 16,000 kids. Uh, so that's really the message that I bring. And, you know, we're going to just, I'm happy to take any questions you have for me if, if you do have any. Besides the Montreal Escos, I, I don't have that kind of power. If I did, I'd <laughs> find a way to navigate this lockout because, you know, we, we need baseball and we need, you know, the, the players to get a fair deal and, and be able to, to be able to play some baseball this coming spring. Good. Uh, let's see if there's any questions. Well, there seems to be, let's go Bucks. That's not quite a question. <laughs> and then speaking as a former resident of Montreal, I'm excited about Hydro-Quebec's involvement, and that's great too. So, um, good. Um, if So, uh, Costa, is there a, what's the time frame on the, um, the project at Variety Boys and Girls Club at this point? Sure. sure. So it looks like we're going to break ground at some point in the middle of next year, and the building will be fully constructed by uh, 2026. Both buildings? Uh, well, it's just, you know, it's the residential, and the residential and the Boys and Girls will be built at the same time. At the same time. Okay. It'll be, like I said before, 100% fully affordable. Mm -hmm. yep. The majority of the units at 60 AMI or below. So that's like two bedrooms for $1,190. Um, we'll have 75 units set aside for young people aging out of foster care. And, you know, that's really, you know, we want to make sure we can integrate, you know, you know, be able to serve the community, serve a very vulnerable population, and, and really to serve all the kids in our neighborhood because there are 8,000 kids in Western Queens below the poverty line. We can serve them and every other child. Uh, and then we've got a great partner also in mega construction. Yes, we do. Yes, we do. And I'll just throw one last thing in is that, you know, there's going to be a call by, um, you know, there shouldn't be competition on renewable energy. We've set up this paradigm in New York State right now uh, where uh, renewable energy projects are competing against each other. And it's a race to the bottom where you have fossil fuel companies that want to go green fighting with entities like with Hydro Quebec for limited spots to create renewable energy in the state of New York. That's not how things should be done. Um, we should be letting fossil fuel entities decide our future. Um, but at the same time, if someone wants to go green, we should have the space to do both. We, there shouldn't be these competitions. Like we should you know, make sure that Hydro Quebec moves forward because it's permanent and ready to go by 2025, 2026. We shouldn't be trying to say, let's take a small step because uh, everyone knows who I was, the council member. I was a chair of the Environmental Protection Committee. The fact of the matter is we have like eight years to deal with the uh, to deal with the possibility of changing the course that we're on for global warming. 
Hmm. Past 2030, we're going to be able to make a dent, but there's going to be a huge bill to pay. And, you know, the possibility of, you know, we've seen huge floods from like, you know, storms like Ida. Uh, so, you know, we need to act on renewable energy projects and, you know, Hudson, uh, the uh, Champlain Hudson uh, Power Express is one that is going to be able to make an impact right away. Okay, good. Well, thank you, Costa. It's a great uh, segue into our next section. Okay. And uh, again, we thank for everything that you do in Astoria, for Astoria. We appreciate it. And uh, we look at uh, being able to keep your record intact. You got to see us every two, three, four months anyway. So anyway, Costa, thanks, guys. thanks a lot. Um, and uh, if there's any questions that came through, we will forward them to you for response. Sounds good. Thanks. Thank you. Okay, so that, and this is a segue because we are uh, pleased to have representatives from the Champlain Power Express joining us now. Um, uh, Transmission Developers CEO Don Jessam, and I hope I'm pronouncing that right, and his team who are doing the installation of the transmission lines. And there is also, there's also joined by a rep from uh, Hydro-Quebec, which is the source of the hydroelectric power in Canada. So if they could come on, if we could please have Don, Jessam, and crew. Hey, we Richard. Appreciate. And so what is the chance of Quebec getting a baseball team? But well, I guess we'll talk about that later. <laughs> <laughs> higher pay grade than I can uh, predict. Uh, <laughs> Well, th thank you, Richard, so much for uh, inviting us here this evening. Uh, we're really pleased to uh, speak to the uh, Old Astoria Neighborhood Association about our project. And uh, also like to thank Costa. He said some very kind words about our project uh, in, in his uh, remarks. So thanks so much. Uh, really has been a great partner working with um, him over the years. I'm joined here today by uh, Pete Rose. Uh, he is with uh, Hydro-Quebec, he represents Hydro-Quebec, and he's the head of stakeholder engagement in New York for uh, Hydro-Quebec. Uh, Kunli Kathy, he is our VP of Project Services, and uh, so he's uh, joining us here today as well. And Jennifer White, who's our VP of External Affairs. So that's the, the dream team from uh, TDI and uh, Hydro-Quebec to talk to you a little bit uh, about our project this evening. And with that, if Victor can put up our presentation, we can uh, walk through a presentation that we pulled together. And Pete Rose, not from the, the Expos, Pete Rose, or the Cincinnati <laughs> <laughs> I have no juice to get the Expos back in the middle. You mean you're not the stuff? <laughs> <laughs> All right, so if we could go to slide two. Um, we'll start off with uh, a little May description. I interject? I'm sorry, Victor, is it possible to make that full screen or something? It's hard to read. Yeah. yeah. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. So I think people can probably still see me. So we're going. I'm going to talk about the high level aspects of the project, sort of at the uh, 10,000 foot level, and then Kun Lee is going to dive right into the very um, uh, local Astoria uh, aspects of the project. So. Let's start off with the, the high level and we've got a transmission line. So we're gonna be building a interconnection, a new interconnection between Quebec and New York City. It, it's two cables. Hopefully you can see me uh, that are physically- no, we, don't, we don't see you, I, just, I don't uh, see you. Maybe I got you don't see a different, oh. Okay. okay, okay, no. Oh, can you see me now? Yes. Mm -hmm. Two cables, uh, about the size of your fists. And they're going to carry uh, enough electricity, each one of them. Oh, may I interject? I'm sorry. Once more. Listen, Victor, take me out of the uh, array, okay? That way we can make more room for everybody else so they can. All right. So e each cable can carry enough electricity for about 600,000 residential homes. So about 1.2 million residential homes uh, worth of electricity will flow on these cables. Uh, it's all buried. So from the border all the way up at Rouse's Point, uh, right in Lake Champlain or next to Lake Champlain um, is where we uh, connect to the Quebec system. We run about a hundred miles south in Lake Champlain. So these two cables will run um, down Lake Champlain. They'll be at the bottom of Lake Champlain and then buried into the bottom of Lake Champlain. We then come up 
onto what's called the CP Railroad right of way, which is the, an existing uh, pre disturbed right of way that will be bearing the cables alongside the railroad tracks. We then over at the Schenectady yard, there's a fairly significant railroad yard there where we switch over to the CSX railroad right of way. So continuing south, we um, again, bury along the CSX rights of way. And then it's a pretty much straight shot down the Hudson River, right into uh, the Harlem River, and then over into Queens, where we'll talk a little bit more in detail on exactly how we do that. Uh, there is one small area on the Hudson. It's in, um, in Rockland County, uh, where we're going to be about seven miles out of the water. Uh, we'll actually bury the cable in uh, Route 9W, so underneath the roadways. And the reason we do that, there's a particularly sensitive uh, bay there called Havistraw Bay, which has a, a lot of endangered species in that particular area. And so we've just decided to avoid that area altogether. So it's a all buried uh, transmission line, two cables, that's gonna bring about approximately 1.2 million uh, residential customers with electricity into New York City. One of the benefits of the project is it's backed by Hydro-Quebec's uh, energy supply. Hydro-Quebec has approximately 37,000 megawatts of hydro in uh, Quebec and 4,000 megawatts of wind. And this is all built. So this is ready to, um, to deliver the energy into New York City immediately once the transmission line is built. And so uh, we, you know, we have a partner who can fill this line 24-7, 365 days of the year which is one of the benefits, uh, many benefits of our project, not the least of which is the fact that other renewable resources such as wind and solar, although they're great resources, they are intermittent in nature. And you really need to have this baseload supply uh, to uh, be able to integrate as much uh, other renewable energy as possible. And certainly the system requires the baseload generation because of course, uh, we all have our habits of when we consume electricity and we, we can't time it to uh, when the sun is shining and when the wind is blowing. So that baseload generation is really critical. How do we, uh, what's our business model? So Hydro-Quebec participated in what's called the Tier 4 Renewable Energy Credit um, NYSERDA RFP. Uh, we did that last year. And uh, the contract was... Um, a competitive process that the state put in place to help fulfill its goals of, of, of being 70% renewable energy by 2030, and then ultimately 100% renewable generation by 2040. So the, uh, the state identified the fact that there is a lot of renewable energy upstate, but very little renewable energy downstate. And to put it in perspective, I think Costa already mentioned this, but 90% of the electricity currently produced in New York City is produced from fossil generation. So the, the uh, oil and gas fire generators are the ones that are producing 90% of the electricity in the city. So the state came up with a program to uh, try and get new transmission and clean energy delivered into the city. And there were two projects selected under that RFP. Our project, the Champlain Nuts and Power Express, and the other project, which is called Clean Path New York, which is a similar project, but will be using in-state wind and um, solar energy to supply uh, that project. Uh, I think Costa also mentioned this, we are fully permitted. So we have what's called our Article 7 state siting permit. We have our presidential permit because we cross an international border. And we have our Army Corps of Engineers permits because we're in navigable waterways. Uh, we've been working uh, on this project for about a decade, so we've, you know, had a lot of opportunity to meet with um, many of the stakeholders in New York State in this project, including uh, widespread support from the environmental, the union, the business community, and the host communities that we traverse over the uh, 339 miles. Um, that strong support has turned into 39, 36 municipalities passing resolutions of support for our project. In addition to that, uh, on a very local uh, benefit perspective, there'll be about $1.7 billion in new tax revenue, revenue over the first 30 years of operation uh, for this project. And that's gonna be benefiting 73 municipalities and 59 school districts. So it's a very widespread uh, beneficial payer 
to many, many communities in New York State and into New York City. Some of the really um, advantages of this project from our perspective is the fact that it's going to be reducing significant amounts of CO2. Uh, it's estimated about 3.9 million metric tons of CO2 uh, reduction on an annual basis from this project. So instead of those fossil generators producing CO2, it's going to be clean hydro uh, producing the electricity and avoiding all that CO2 production, which is the main uh, goals of the state uh, law CLCPA and local law 97, which is the New York City equivalent to reduce um, harmful emissions in the city. But also on a very localized perspective, and we'll talk a little bit more about this, uh, because we're connecting right into the, the uh, Astoria complex in Queens, it's traditionally where there has been a lot of fossil generation. And because we're going to be connecting into that part of the grid, we'll actually be displacing the, that fossil generation, which produces a lot of harmful um, byproducts, not just CO2, but NOx and SOx um, generation and particulate matter, all of which are cause health uh, issues, uh, costed described it very well as Asthma Alley, and displacing that generation is really a great local benefit from this project. Uh, we are an organized labor union uh, uh, project, and we'll be having about 1,400 direct jobs during the four years of construction, and approximately 3,000 secondary jobs get created because of those um, primary jobs. And we're looking to start generation, or start construction on the project uh, the next couple of months. And you know we are truly shovel ready, just waiting for um, the contract that I had mentioned earlier, the tier four contract to be approved by the Public Service Commission and we'll be in a position to be able to start construction on this project. And we'll be in service by 2025. So significantly ahead of the 2030 date that the state has um, set for itself to get to 70% renewables. And again, just to put it in perspective, we expect to, uh, deliver on an annual basis approximately 20% of the energy needs for New York uh, City on an annual basis. So this is a very significant amount of energy, clean energy, that's going to be coming into the city. And because of the fact that it's all buried, uh, we had talked about Sandy and Ida and the uh, situation where you have uh, storms that, that can you know, knock out the power. The fact that this is all buried uh, infrastructure. It's what we call hardened infrastructure from a uh, reliability perspective. And the other benefit is the generation, which is up in Quebec, is significantly uh, far away from New York City. So it's really hard to imagine any sort of uh, storm or disturbance that would affect uh, such a large area that it could potentially knock out the, the generation in Quebec and um, uh, have uh, power outages in New York City. So Victor, next slide, please. So why were we selected by the uh, state for um, the tier four program? As I had mentioned, we're fully permitted and um, you know, we'll be reducing a significant amount of CO2 and other harmful pollutants. Uh, the positive health impacts uh, was one of the reasons why uh, the state selected us. There's a, a, a significant amount of local uh, jobs in the community and it's a unionized uh, labor uh, project. So we'll have a PLA for this project and we have significant amount of um, uh, criteria within the contract that we have to work with the communities to get as many um, folks in the uh, local community to work on this project as possible. We're gonna talk a little bit more about how we're going to do that uh, in a couple of slides. I had mentioned the buried infrastructure. I had mentioned the fact that we're 24 seven, seven days a week, which just is a, is a wonderful addition to the system. And of course, the tax revenues that I had mentioned on the previous slide. So these are all uh, the criteria that, some of the criteria that uh, the state used to select this project. So Victor, next slide, please. So let me just talk a little bit about the, uh, we call the environmental and social justice aspects of this project by injecting that firm hydropower directly into into the city as i had mentioned we're going to be displacing um, the fossil generation that would have otherwise been generating in the city 
And again, just as a reminder, 90% of all electricity produced in New York City right now is fossil generation. So it's producing not only CO2, but it's also producing those, those local uh, air pollutants, which cause all the health impacts. So we've looked at what does that mean? And sort of on an equivalence basis of the pollution that the peaking plants that uh, are currently in New York City, and there are 16 of them around the city, it's equivalent to, to removing 15 of those 16 peaking plants from a local pollutants perspective. So we think that's a, a significant benefit in terms of uh, the local air quality. And then as another uh, data point, it's, it's equivalent to removing about 44% of the cars off New York City streets. So a really, really important local uh, community benefit from a health perspective. Uh, TDI has worked very closely uh, with the communities to ensure that the design has been respectful of the neighborhoods that we're going through. We're completely committed to hiring local whenever possible, and we're going to be hiring a dedicated outreach employee to ensure access to uh, uh, project jobs um, as we do construction. We have a $40 million fund that's co-sponsored by our partner Hydro-Quebec and TDI, so $20 million each that will be going into a fund called the Green Economy Fund, which I'll talk a little bit more about here in just a minute. We've committed to a $117 million environmental trust fund for water projects and research. And this is for the um, use of the water bodies that we traverse, like Champlain, Hudson, Harlem, and East River. Uh, we have a board already established. We have a, a trust company that's running it today. New York City has representation on this uh, fund. so. There are uh, projects, uh, some of our most early projects that we're looking at right now uh, actually are going to be in the Harlem and East River. So that those funds are going to be spent right in the city um, as early as this year. Uh, the funding uh, is going to start flowing. And we also have a $9 million community investment fund, again, co-sponsored uh, between TDI and Hydro-Quebec. And Costa mentioned uh, the recent announcement for the STEM lab at the uh, Boys and uh, Girls Club of Queens. And so that's actually our first announced project under that community investment fund. Next slide, please. So let me talk a little bit more about the Green Economy Fund. That's the $40 million jobs training uh, fund, primarily for frontline communities and uh, local hiring commitments. Uh, it's going to be support residents living in disadvantaged and frontline communities across the state, uh, but there will be significant uh, emphasis put uh, on the city because there's a large amount of construction in the city itself. And these are going to be creating access to good paying jobs uh, with the organized labor that we will be using to, to build our project. Uh, it's been developed in close consultation with local work, work uh, development experts, labor unions, housing authorities, uh, Jen White, who is on uh, the call with me here this evening, she's been instrumental along with Pete, uh, Pete Rose from Hydro-Quebec in establishing this uh, fund and getting it uh, operational. So we certainly have the experts here tonight uh, to be able to speak to it. And, and, you know, it's going to be serving the needs of the communities, uh, as I mentioned, across the entire um, state. And you know, it's really established for the for the green uh, jobs training programs, uh, not just for the local community, but also for workers transitioning from the fossil fuel industry. The way we think about this fund is it's really important to uh, realize that this project is going to be in service for 60 plus years in uh, New York State, and we have four years of construction. So we thought it was really, really important to establish this fund to uh, not only help people uh, get the opportunities on the construction jobs uh, when they're in your community, but more importantly, to help the training of people to look for those new green economy jobs uh, beyond our project in terms of the construction work in our project, but look for those longer term uh, green economy jobs. So we're very excited about getting this fund up and uh, running, and there'll be more to say about uh, this fund in the uh, coming months. Uh, ahead of us. Next slide, please. And just a little bit more, I, I've talked about the technology, but HVDC, which is high voltage direct current, 
Uh, that that is a little bit different technology than what you traditionally have in your home, which is AC current. Uh, the reason we use DC is because it's uh, very good in cable format, so you can um, move a lot of electricity with DC cables much more efficiently than AC cables. Uh, as an example, we lose about 3% of the electricity or the power on our line over that very long distance all the way up into Quebec. If we were to do that with AC cables, uh, first off, you'd have to have three cables instead of two. But secondly, you'd, you'd lose probably 30 to 40% of the electricity um, uh, due to inefficiency of using AC cables. So that's why we use DC cables. And you can see the picture um, of somebody uh, holding up a typical cable. So that's the physical size of the cables that we're talking about. They're five inches in diameter. In Astoria, we'll actually be building a converter station. So that converts the DC power to AC. And we need to do that because the AC power is actually what's uh, in your home. And so in order to be able to distribute it across the entire city and actually the state, uh, the electricity needs to be converted to AC. So there'll be a, a, a building and a substation built to uh, connect into the Con Ed grid. But the beautiful thing about this uh, facility, unlike a thermal generating or a fossil generating facility, this is a benign facility in that it, it literally is just converting electricity from DC to AC. So no emissions coming from this, this facility at all. And in fact, it's going to be the one that's going to be displacing um, all of the emissions from the generation, the fossil generation that won't be running because it's coming into the city. And then typical installation and um, Kun Lee, is go who's going to take over in just a minute here, he'll talk um, a lot more detail, particularly uh, in Astoria, how we're going to be uh, doing some AC upgrades in order to make the distribution of the electricity even better um, than just using a single substation. We're typically buried, whether it's in roadways or in waterways, about five to six feet uh, below the surface. And this is just a typical cross section showing how the DC cables uh, would be uh, buried um, along with actually there's a fiber optic cable that runs all the way up into uh, Quebec as well. So there's a um, telecommunications cable that uh, comes with this project. And with that, I'm going to pass uh, the baton over to Kun Lee, who's going to talk to you a little bit more about um, some of the work that we're going to be doing in your community. Great. Thanks, Don. Uh, if you could move it to the next slide. I just wanted to talk to you a little bit about the physical work where we actually get the AC power out of the Astoria facility and try to connect to the Ray Con Edison Rainy substation. That's where the distribution of the power goes into the Con Ed system. We're gonna be looking at about three miles, approximately three miles of construction within the roadways uh, from the Astoria facility to the Rainy substation. We've been working uh, with the different uh, roadway owners, DOT, parks, and all of the other um, entities that have utilities in the area like Con Edison to basically optimize this route. And after working with them for the past three or four years, we all agreed on an optimized route that basically comes out on 20th Avenue for about a half a mile, goes along Shaw Boulevard uh, for close to a mile, and avoids a lot of the core center of the community. I uh, just wanted to also note that while we're on Shaw Boulevard, all of the parks uh, properties will still be usable. The bike lanes will be kept open and the walkways will be fully accessible. And uh, we make a quick turn on Astoria Park South and basically go down the middle of 14th Street um, for about another three quarters of a mile where we make a turn onto Broadway and return onto Vernon Boulevard to get to the Con Edison Rainy, uh, Rainy substation. So we're in the process of uh, basically moving this design forward, but uh, essentially this is an established route that all of the key owners of the right of way, DOT, Parks, Con Edison, Verizon, and all of the subsurface utility owners have agreed on to. If you go to the next slide. So just talking about the construction itself and the, uh, the, what, what is it that the community is going to see when the construction is happening? 
the installation of the cables in Astoria, the AC cable is going to be like when DEP or Con Ed or Verizon is doing work in the neighborhood. So what you're going to see is not going to be any different. We expect that we're, we're going to need some more time to do a lot of design and to do some community coordination. And uh, basically, based on that schedule, we also have to do what is called an environmental management and construction plan, which is submitted and approved to the state before we can do any construction and get a permit from the New York City DOT. All of that work is going to start right now. And we expect that by summer of 2023, we would be starting the construction on a segment by segment basis for the three miles and using that approach, we're going to be done with full construction, full restoration of the entire three miles by spring of 2025. We, to mitigate um, the impact of the construction, we're going to basically divide up the three miles into sub-segments so that the construction will occur on a block-by-block -block basis. And basically what that means is the community uh, within a block will only be impacted with our construction within a three to four month period. And uh, all of the street closings, I mean, all of the lane closings will be fully coordinated with DOT and co coordinated with the community to make sure that we minimize lane closures and street closures as the construction is happening. And um, also one of the things we're gonna be doing is when we're not having construction, all of the construction zones going to be plated so that there will be continuous use of the roadway when we're not working. Um, we will be basically establishing a community outreach group uh, that's going to be led by Jennifer White to communicate with the community, get input as the design gets developed, and we we're going to plan to have open houses with the community so we can get some input from the community uh, to mitigate any of the full impact of this construction effort. Uh, next slide, please. So I just wanted to give you a little bit of an overview of what the overall construction is going to look like. I mean, some of the images you see in the picture here are actual constructions, uh, activities in different parts of the city. Um, so the two that you see are actually up in Rockland County. And uh, the picture in the middle there is the final restoration where they're restoring the, uh, the asphalt on the roadway. Essentially, our construction is going to consist of uh, six cables, uh, uh, six cables, five, five inches thickness housed in an eight, eight inch conduit and basically encased in a three by five concrete dock bank that would be installed within the roadway at you know, very in depth, depending on what we have to deal with in the roadway. Um, you know, Astoria already, a lot of the roadways in Astoria already has a lot of uh, existing subsurface utility within the roadway. We have DEP infrastructure, we have Con Ed infrastructure, and um, part of what we have to do in our design process is to work with all of those utility owners to safely meander up and down or around the utility to get from the Astoria facility to Rainey. So our activity will begin with basically making sure that we get a fully approved uh, traffic management and control plan during construction. All of that has to be approved by the state and by DOT and by the community. Uh, we would then start to make sure that we physically locate all of the existing utilities and uh, mark those utilities, make sure that the utility owners understand how we're going to go through them. And after that, the construction process starts in segments. We would open the trench, put in our conduits and duct bank, uh, basically backfill them with concrete and restore them to New York City DOT qualified uh, uh, layout and then basically come back once all of that is done and do a final asphalt paving uh, with the markings and the bike path and everything the way it's, it is before. So that just gives you a good idea of what would be happening on a segment by segment basis in the three to four month period 
that we identify for the segment. Next slide, please. So what are the things that we're gonna be working on to mitigate the impact in the community during construction? We're gonna be working with DOT and the relevant community stakeholders to minimize all of potential impacts during construction by basically number one, working through a block by block specific design process. Um, we're gonna try to make sure that we minimize impact on foot traffic I mean, the good thing is all of what we're going to be doing here is going to be in the pavement. So the, the curbs and the sidewalks are not going to be impacted. So pedestrian traffic would not be hampered. Uh, we're going to make sure that in working across the street, we maintain ADA requirements, um, minimize impact on street parking. Uh, as we do the work, we're going to basically be coming up with uh, block specific plans to mitigate impact on street parking. And like I said before, when we're not working, we're going to basically be plating over the, the, the trench area so that the, the parking can happen in at night or during the times that we're not working. We're going to basically work with New York City Transit uh, and uh, review bus schedules to make sure that we don't impact uh, bus stops and basically we would, basically we would be working with them to make sure that we come up with any temporary walkarounds to continue the bus traffic within the affected areas. Uh, another important one is the bike lanes. Uh, we're gonna be following New York City DOT guidance for you know, temporary relocating and preserving the bike lanes around our construction. Um, we're gonna be working with DOT on this as we develop the construction plan and uh, last but not the least, we're going to be uh, establishing the fact that the city bike locations will be protected and we'll be working with the city bike ownership to basically temporarily, if needed, relocate uh, some of the bike locations around the progress of our construction. Uh, all of this is going to be done around construction periods that's going to happen around the uh, occupancy of the blocks. Um, when we get into residential areas, we might be doing uh, daytime work. In other areas where we have industry, uh, we might do nighttime work just so that, you know, we minimize the overall impact on the community. So, um, you know, we'll stay tuned and we're going to be working on these plans and we'll be coming back with development plans as we get into full design before we get to construction. So that... With that, I think I will turn it back to Don uh, to uh, lead us if there are any questions. Okay. Thanks for the great presentation. Um, I have just one quick question. I just wanna be clear in my head. Um, this particular project, when it's bringing in uh, the power, it's not directly replacing the peaker plants. What it's doing is increasing the general supply of electricity of clean power so that the peaker plants won't be needed um, as much. Is, am I getting, is that correct? Is that Because uh, it's, it's not going to really directly source uh, into the plants that are existing here now, correct? Yeah, I think Don might no longer be there, but I, I can take this, right? So the, mm -hmm. the, the project will not physically be replacing a peaker plant that's physically there. Mm -hmm. uh, what it is doing is providing the clean power that's going to allow the system not to have to run those peaker plants. Okay. I have a question, another question too. Does New York City currently get hydropower? I mean, does a Niagara um, station actually feed into New York City? Yeah, I would, I would, I would let our friends from NIPA answer that. But, but okay. hydropower is a, is a a well known. It's it's the, the oldest form of renewable energy. It's the largest form of renewable energy in New York State. Mm -hmm. um, out of the twenty eight percent of clean energy we have in New York State, roughly, I would say about twenty percent of it actually is hydro. So it's a very well known energy source. Mm -hmm. uh, just from from Quebec, uh, we have been selling hydropower into New York State for a hundred years. And this opportunity through the transmission line that, that Don described is the ability now to take that hydropower from Quebec and bring it directly into New York City. So hence uh, the two cool. sides of the project. 
One is the energy. The other side is actually delivering it through the transmission line. Part of the, and not devil's advocate, but part of the opposition that I've heard has to do with the fact that they say that you're sourcing your power through dams and those dams are causing carbon uh, emissions. Could you drill down on that a little bit and say whether that's a really uh, effective argument against this project? Uh, I, I would also leave that to the international community, the state, the city, the entire country of the United States that recognizes renewable uh, hydropower is renewable energy. So I would just leave it at a full stop. A renewable meaning that it's on the same emissions um, footprint as any other renewable energy, whether it's solar or wind. Full okay. stop. Okay. Um, and there is one actually very pertinent question, and it has to do with hydropower indirectly, um, from Inga Baklavosky and says, why is this being, should this be done under the streets? Why couldn't you go via the East River? And I can, I can take that. I mean, we, in permitting these projects from like 2010 and onwards, the state, the federal government and the Army Corps prevented us from uh, using the East River to come up to uh, Rainy. Um, this was a point that was studied um, for a long time, and um, we just didn't get approval because that uh, the East River was basically open and reserved for other types of project that the hydrokinetic project that the feds were trying to implement to bring hydrokinetic energy to New York City. So it's been off limits, and uh, that's why we had to go to Astoria and, and then from Astoria try to connect to the rainy stroke substation by, by uh, roadway. Um, from what I understand from our meeting last night when I, we, we met, that that hydrokinetic project is actually looking at creating turbines within the East River itself to generate power, and that's why they want to keep the area around Hell's Gate in this area free, from what I understand. Yep. That's why I said yep. it was related to hydropower. So. Yeah. <laughs> so, mm -hmm. Good. Um, and this is a good question again from Inga. Uh, what about radiation that wires or the electromagnetic, uh, I guess, I'm not sure the right word for it, but there is an electromagnetic component. Um, what about the radiation from the wires underneath the streets? Sure. So I, I, I could take it first and then Kunli can fill in. Um, so so uh, any electrical piece of equipment, whether it's in your home or, or wires in the street, uh, has uh, an electromagnetic field. Uh, one of the there's many ways that you can shield it. Uh, first off, you bury it. First off, you put it in a cable format that has uh, shielding associated with it. Uh, you put the cables in such a way that they actually can uh, cancel uh, some of the magnetic fields out by just the configuration of how they're put into the streets. So, so there's many ways that you can uh, shield that electromagnetic field. Uh, I, I will tell you that uh, that was very carefully studied, uh, modeled and studied. Uh, the Public Service Commission, DEC and others um, were very instrumental in all of that analysis and were, far, or were well below the uh, threshold uh, New York State uh, considers uh, in terms of the uh, allowable magnetic and electric fields. Kunli, I don't know if you have additional. No, I think that. you answered it all. I mean, we're way, way, way under limit of uh, just what you would be measuring at street level, and all of this is published information that that was reviewed and approved by the Public Service Commission. Okay, that was a question from Jeff Martin, and I'm not even sure what this is, but where is the VSC converter station going? So, Victor, if you could go to slide seven on the presentation. Sorry to put you on the spot. <laughs> right there. Yep. So if you look on the right hand side, right by the table where it says total length, that's the uh, Con Ed Astoria complex. Pretty much currently in the center of the complex, I'd say, is where the converter station is going to go exactly where the label or the name is there somewhere in that little box where the Conet Astoria complex right office is where the converter station is going to be located and i think okay. currently right now there's a couple of oil tanks sitting on top of that right now and those are going to be coming down and that's where the converter station will go that is correct 
Yeah, I'm so, curious so, to know if there would be any ill effects. There's a couple of uh, uh, projects going on in that area. One is a new sanitation garage for the area, and the other just over the creek there, the, um, Lester Creek, there's going to be a new um, movie studio going in. Um, so I wondered whether, yeah, it's actually the studio is being, um, uh, is owned by the De Niro family and another, another uh, uh, partner oh. for them. So I just would want to also make sure that there's no kind of radiation issues or anything that might affect anything to do with that facility. So, I, I mean, I'll just talk again, high level and Kunli, please jump in. Uh, Again, uh, all of these pieces of equipment uh, have to be below um, state standards. And so they're designed to ensure that they don't interfere with, you know, all, all kinds of things, um, not the least of which, like, uh, you know, th there's a, actually an air traffic control tower uh, in that facility. And we have to make sure that uh, none of the um, electromagnetic fields associated with the converter station uh, interferes with any, any of the pieces of equipment around us. Uh, the good news is it's all below the standard. It's all shielded. It's all protected to make sure that it does not in interfere with uh, equipment around us. Okay, there's other questions coming through here. Um, um, it's, it's when you describe power delivery system as being green, you must also consider environmental effects during construction and maintenance. I think you pretty much addressed a lot of that. Um, you know, there's no question. Um, so we have a four year construction plan and, you know, there, there definitely is temporary disturbances. There, there's no question. I mean, in any construction job, there's always temporary uh, disturbances. But if you look at the broader picture in terms of 60 years of clean hydro supply coming into the city, supplying, you know, in the particularly in the early years, uh, over 20 percent of the electricity supply, the, the small amount of inconvenience, and, and I'm not trying to diminish the amount of construction in, in, inconvenience or temporary environmental effects, um, they, they are there, but they are uh, temporary and the, the long-term benefits far exceed the uh, short-term uh, yeah. issues. Yeah, one thing that was brought up in our meeting last night though, with the, at the community board office, which um, would be an inconvenience, and I think it is something you really need to look at, is the intersection of Broadway and Vernon Boulevard by Socrates Park and by Costco, which has a lot of traffic constantly. So I know that's one person was, uh, was talked about trying to do construction at night. I'm not sure if that works, and I don't even particularly have an answer for this but I think it's something that really needs to be looked at. It's a very busy corner yeah. and Costco is a very busy facility. So um, there are other, we're going to run out of time here for this segment. There's a, other questions concerning radiation. Um, what levels of radiation are you transporting? There is redundancy in the installs that right. You said you had six cables. So, so there's six, yeah, there's six cables between the Con Ed um astoria complex over to the vernon uh the, to the rainy substation yep so there's there's six cables there uh the rest of the 339 miles so that's three miles of six cables but for the 339 miles coming from quebec it's only two cables two cables i see okay but there is redundancy in the in the city yeah there's so so the reason we're connecting to more than one substation is uh, one of the things that the city identified very early on in the permitting process is they wanted to make sure that this is truly a legacy project. You know, there's only going to be one opportunity to, to be able to connect uh, all the way up into Quebec. Uh, and so they wanted to make sure that the distribution on the Con Ed system was distributed to, to more than just one substation. And so that's what we're doing by running the cables between the uh, Astoria substation and over to the rainy substation that ensures that the distribution can be spread out kind of like a, a spider's web um, in, into uh, multiple points on the, on the con ed grid and that ensures that it gets delivered to as many points in the city and actually um, it's connected all the way into the entire state's grid so there's benefits not just in the city but it goes uh, north as well Okay, um, I would like to make one last, I'll read one last comment, and then I think we need to bring it the New York Power Authority. They've been waiting patiently in the background, and we also don't want people to run away and grab dinner. 
So I don't, the good thing about being virtual is they can grab dinner and watch the program too. So but from, from Jeff Martin. Okay. I was going to mention that uh, uh, about the sanitation and the studio. If Hydro Quebec is looking for additional projects to benefit the community, we are pushing for public space and waterfront access, connecting the Con, uh, Con Ed soccer field park adjacent to the VSC converter and propose and propose sanitary facility. There is um, Lester Creek there, which needs to be dredged out, which needs to be cleaned. There is already the studio is actually going to be landscaping part of that area on on the. Uh, eastern shore of the creek but it would serve and the sanitation is going to be on the other side but they're non-committal as far as i know unless something else has happened as to doing further work there but this might be an area where your contributions might be greatly appreciated wait well you've got the right person jen's on here so uh, <laughs> uh the, the last slide on the deck's got her uh, email her uh, cell number uh so she is the person you need to talk to uh, because she is the one who's going to be working with uh with the uh, green economy fund to uh, fund projects like that and richard before you even raised it i had snapped a shot of jeff martin's comment in the comment section perfect great perfect okay good so I'll put my email in the in the in the comment section as well. So. Yeah, give it to Victor and he can put it in. Great. Mm -hmm. Yeah, good. All right, great. So, so uh, I want to let everybody know that any questions that were not answered because we ran out of time, we will be forwarding these questions to the presenters. Um, they will uh, hopefully respond, and we will get them out on social <laughs> media. Thank you so much for joining us. Um, it's going to be, I think this whole project is going to be a uh, game changer for in many ways. I know for a while our game may change negatively, but I, in the long run, I think it will change positively. Thanks so much. Yeah. Thank, Thank you. you Rich. I appreciate Thank it. Bye-bye. Okay. And folks, um, we'd like to now bring out um, the New York State power authority these are the people that actually um uh, oversee and regulate all the power generation and movement within the state of new york uh, we are joined by james serta uh, of the outreach uh wing of uh nipa and also we have kayla mainsa from the environmental justice team and i think there is also one other person i don't have their name but i'm sure that james can give it so james Kayla and the third party. <laughs> uh, we're uh, That's Anna, Anna. Schur, Hello, Anna. Who will help us uh, <laughs> navigate our slides. We uh, we couldn't communicate us without Anna. Uh, we're uh, uh, <laughs> ah, uh, okay, great. Kayla, so your, Anna you. is my, is your Victor. That's correct. Yes, perfect. They went to different schools together, I guess, right? <laughs> but, uh, to use the old uh, old line. But uh, I'm thrilled that Kyla can join us to give uh, uh, her. Uh, uh, expertise and perspective on our environmental justice initiatives. And uh, uh, just to clarify, we don't oversee uh, power generation. I mean, we create, we generate power. The Public wow. Service Commission oversees wow. us okay. as well as the likes of Con Edison and uh, other interested uh, utilities. And uh, we are a, uh, a large generator of, uh, of hydropower as uh, Pete Rose expressed uh, earlier. Uh, most notably from our Niagara plant and uh, and St. Lawrence. Uh, and if we could uh, tee up our, our first slide, that would be great. So we uh, we have our uh, our title. This is uh, you know designed for you guys, and we uh, we appreciate the chance to visit. Uh, if we can. Uh, uh, transition to the next slide as uh, the power authority has been around since uh, since 1931 and things have changed over time and uh, our uh, our mission is to lead a transition to a carbon free economically vibrant uh, new york through our customer partnerships uh, our innovation and responsible supply of affordable clean and reliable electricity uh, we are the largest state public power organization in the, in the nation we operate 16 generating facilities and more than 1,400 circuit miles of transmission lines. Uh, more than 80% of the electricity we produce is clean, renewable hydropower, as I had touched on earlier. 
Uh, we uh, receive no tax money or state credits. Uh, we operate through the sale of bonds and revenues earned in large part uh, through the sales of electricity. Uh, that's a distinction between an authority and a, a state agency, among other rather arcane points. But if we can uh, go to the next slide, we are uh, very conscious of how we treat each other and our customers. We work for the greater good and a stronger, sustainable New York. Uh, we hold ourselves to the highest standards of integrity, safety, and excellence. We are resilient. We use our ingenuity to make big things happen, and we uh, we draw strength from our diversity. Everyone contributes. Everyone belongs, and we work as one united team. Anna, if you would go to the next slide, we have a a vision, twenty thirty uh, plan with our strategic priorities. We're very proud of our uh, of our hydropower facilities, as we. Uh, uh, had touched on earlier, and we're doing our, our, our very best to preserve that power, hydropower, and that capability so we can efficiently uh, uh, service the residents of the state of New York. We uh, uh, want to continue to be the leading transmission developer and owner and operator in New York State uh, and, and to address the changing electricity needs of our customers. Uh, we want to pioneer the path to decarbonization. I know everybody is, is talking quite a bit about that tonight. Uh, we want to uh, uh, be a test bed and experiment uh, and innovate and uh, use our ingenuity and reliability and, and to make sure everything is affordable. And we, uh, we always uh, uh, anticipate and, and, and uh, make it a priority to partner with our customers and the state to meet the energy goals of the Climate Leadership and Community Protection Act. We also uh, operate the New York State Canal System, uh, which is a 525 mile waterway from the Hudson River to uh, Lake Erie. And uh, uh, that requires a lot of work. I know it doesn't really apply to Astoria, but that's another uh, uh, item for us to uh, to manage and and use our uh, our ingenuity and uh, carry our values and our mission forward. Uh, Anna, if you could go to the next uh, slide, the uh, we, we've uh, I know you've heard about the Climate Leadership and Community Protection Act. It's the most aggressive and uh, climate and clean energy initiative in the nation. It calls for a transition to renewable energy that creates jobs and continues fostering a green economy as we uh, recover from the COVID pandemic. Uh, Governor Hochul is currently working to carry out the plan that had been started uh, earlier. Uh, the, uh, it, the, the CLCPA puts New York on a path to achieving its mandated goal of zero carbon emission electricity sector by 2040 including 70% renewable energy generation by 2030. Uh, that builds on New York's uh, unprecedented ramp up of, uh, of clean energy, including a, a, a $3.9 billion investment in 67 large scale renewable projects across the state and the creation of more than 150,000 jobs in New York's clean energy sector and a commitment to develop 9,000 megawatts of offshore wind by 2035. Uh, we, uh, New York claim, uh, aims to reduce greenhouse gas emissions by 85% from 1990 levels by 2050. Anna, please, the next uh, slide. We uh, are very proud of uh, uh, our energy efficiency projects uh, that have uh, been launched since the late 1980s. Uh, these projects are, are uh, at uh, more than 3,200 public facilities in New York City. Over $2 billion has, invest, has been invested in wide-ranging improvements from lighting to HVAC upgrades, and it has resulted in approximately $170 million in annual savings in energy and operation and maintenance costs, and we've eliminated 45,000 tons of greenhouse gas emissions annually. And there are, uh, a comprehensive support in partnering with the public entities uh, who have been uh, longtime customers of ours have included it, it's providing hundreds of millions of dollars in financing for this initiative. And specifically for Queens, 
Uh, some of this might travel to uh, our environmental justice initiatives. We have 292 energy efficiency programs and 554 facilities in Queens, a total cost of $446,745,103. The uh, operation and maintenance and maintenance savings of that is $1,547,706. The uh, uh, This is uh, fueled economic development uh, with some 20 companies and 9,900 kilowatts are allocated uh, at full-time employment uh positions are committed uh, that have been committed are 11,618 uh the new york times uh printing facility in the uh, off the whitestone expressway is 5,150 kilowatts 467 full-time jobs that are committed there and st john's university 680 kilowatts and 2,321 full-time jobs our vision 2030 plan uh, is that we want to provide clean energy roadmaps uh, for the next decade to the NIPA customers and for the entire state. Uh, we have installed charging stations at the JFK airport uh, consisting of 150 kilowatt units. Uh, that's for both the buses and passenger vehicles. And we continue our ongoing communication with elected officials and stakeholders. If we can... Uh, I think I'll I, now I hand, I'll hand the ball to Kyla for the environmental justice segment. Perfect. Um, good evening, everyone. My name is Kyla Mainsa, and I'm the director of environmental justice at the Power Authority. So I just wanted to tell you a little bit about our department, which is an internal department that supports Sniper's um, operations. So our mission is to really try and be a good neighbor, and so we try and leverage our expertise and um, you know, experience in energy efficiency and clean energy transmission for the benefit of our, of our, our environmental justice and, and um, frontline communities that host our facilities. Um, I sit in White Plains um, and I have a small team, but we cover statewide, all the way from the border with, um, with Canada in St. Lawrence, our large um, hydropower facilities upstate, down to um, Sini which covers um, Astoria and all the five boroughs and Staten Island and Long Island. So that's what we do. We try to build programs that will really benefit um, our communities. We do this in four ways. Um, we have a STEM um, education program and our STEM programs provide hands-on learning experiences for children ranging from K to 12 and also through to college. And our, and our goal is to help bridge um, the STEM achievement gap for students who attend some of these schools um, in our stakeholder communities. And through school programs, summer camps, career exposure workshops, we strive to build students' interest and confidence in science and technology. Um, and the second pillar of our program is adult energy literacy. I know that today you've heard a lot of um, terminology about solar, about wind, about transmission projects, about hydropower. We try to break that down. Our team really um, goes into the community wherever you are. All you have to provide us is a room and we bring all the information and we try and try and help everyone understand what these terms are. So based on the specific energy burden expressed by our stakeholders, I think a lot of you mentioned the high energy costs from Quanet. By the way, we don't have residential customers. So um, I know that some a lot of people are experiencing the, the high energy burden. But we've developed workshops um, designed to educate um, adults in the community about energy efficiency, about clean energy, and about the intersection between climate change, resiliency, and health. Um, and so that pro that um, second uh, photograph that you can see, this is a, one of our community energy programs where we actually bring props to try and make sure that your windows are weatherized and we show people how to do it. Um, our main point is to do low cost, no cost, um, small things you can do to make sure that your home is completely insulated and weatherized so that you can keep all the heat that you're paying so highly for. Um, in terms of um, engagement and advocacy, we support um, community events, back to school events, and you'll hear a little bit more about who we've partnered with. Um, we also consider ourselves an internal voice, um, an internal advocate for, for communities. And so as NIPA is deploying their strategic programs, we try to make sure that the community is considered in that deployment of programs. 
And finally, community energy projects. We have um, a small budget that we complete non-recoverable energy efficiency projects for communities. Um, upstate, we completed, for example, we replaced their um, appliances upstate um, and upstate uh, in terms of the Messina Housing Authority and the Niagara Falls Housing Authority. And for those housing authorities, they actually pay their own bills. So that helps them directly in terms of reducing their energy bills. Downstate with NYCHA, we're doing a few more things that um, I'll, I'll explain later. Um, next slide, please. So just talking locally, um, I wanted to just highlight a few of our programs. Um, you know, we've, we've really um, partnered with community-based organizations, like the settlement houses that are around um, uh, some of the NYCHA facilities, like Woodside Houses, Queensbridge, the Floating Hospital. And we partner with them to try and make sure that everything that NYPA is doing um, in terms of the demonstration projects, energy efficiency, electric vehicles, we teach that so that students can understand what does it look like to participate and be um, a, a part of this clean energy transition? What are the jobs of the future? We bring um, engineers and scientists to try and tell their story. Our motto is, if you can see it, you can be it. And so, you know, a lot of our students that are, and our stakeholders might have thought about a career in, um, I don't know, in sports or in, in another field. But, you know, as we transition, we've talked a lot about the transition, the utility industry, not just that NIPA, at Con Ed, at National Grid, there's a lot of these um, different utilities. It's an aging population. So the jobs of the future are in this transition. We want to make sure that our stakeholders can participate. We've also partnered with the Astoria Boys and Girls Club. So we've talked to Costa quite a few times and we've done some of these programs. Um, in terms of um, PTEC and scholarships, we also want to make sure that we're equipping um, uh, our students to be able to participate. So we've partnered with um, specific schools to provide internships for high school students. And this gives them a hands-on experience, a, a, a summer experience where we pay them. And we make sure that, they, that um, they're getting that resume building um, experience for their future careers. We also have scholarships, college scholarships. Um, we offer 10 scholarships um, in the, for the whole statewide. And we've partnered with a lot of the community-based organizations to say that you bring us your stakeholder and you recommend candidates for us to give scholarships to. It's a competitive um, application process, but they make all the recommendations for us. And those are $10,000 scholarships that we give to students who actually want to pursue a career in STEM. In terms of um, green classrooms, um, we, we have partnered with um, many different organizations to ensure that we are converting some of the science labs, some of the classrooms into hydropon in public schools into hydroponic um, science labs. So there we build um, these hydroponic systems and we pay for curriculum so that the teachers are teaching about climate change, about sustainability. We, we try and build these um, um, greenhouse classroom um, programs in areas where there are food, food deserts, where um, they, they, there isn't that um, availability and that reliance on, on um, fresh food. So while the students are learning about healthy eating and about nutrition, they're also learning about um, climate change and sustainability. And so those are the schools that are listed there. We, we are actually um, have those green classrooms and we're supporting these classrooms to try and make sure that their curriculum is, is, is involved. And, and you know, there are also career pathways in these new um, hydroponic um, classrooms. Our, our project this year is at the Astoria Houses where we're actually building a hydroponics lab there um, at uh, Astoria Houses and that we're going to have a ribbon cutting and I believe that they're having a health fair and so we'll be there to try and open it up to the community. We're partnering with Haddock, which is a community-based organization that runs these after-school programs. And we're trying to make sure that um, we provide those opportunities to intersect and understand about um, building um, vegetables and fresh fruit locally. Next slide, please. And so we just really wanted to just talk about, you know, upcoming, we have um, partnered with um, Richard Kazami's team to try and ask about um, community-based organizations that we can partner with. You can see there, we, as I mentioned, that our programs are no cost. Um, we just really need the room and the stakeholders. We have food, you know, in these known COVID times, we, we do them virtually, but we prefer to actually be there on the, we bring our props so that people can actually try and, um, you know, try all the things out. And we, we support um, back to school nights where we bring, um, you know, uh, school supplies in September so that make sure that we, we can actually be helping to alleviate that cost of sending your children to school. 
But really, it's about trying to make sure that we're giving that education and that energy literacy and sharing our information. So some of the, those are some of the people that we partner with. Next slide. I mentioned that we are trying to be the uh, internal voice. And so um, last year, um, we partnered with um, the PEAT Coalition, which is a group of five leading environmental justice and clean energy advocates. Um, you might be familiar with a lot of these, these groups. And um, we established an MOU with them to explore new technology that, that would aid in this transition. As we mentioned before, you know, um, we, it's going to be a transition as we move from fossil fuel to cleaner energy. And so we're exploring with them as part of an MOU, what are the, the technology, what, is, what are the ways that we're going to make this, this transition? Um, while still bearing in mind the resiliency that's going to be needed um, as we make that transition, because in some cases, sometimes the technology isn't there yet, and so what does that path look like? And um, that's really um, my end. I'm going to pass back to Jim Serta, but if you have community-based organizations that you would like to recommend that we partner with, I would like to um, make sure that you have my contact details, and we're happy to come and partner with your community-based organizations. Thank you. Thank you, Kyla. The, uh, we can uh, tie up tonight's program with uh, some commentary about our East River Battery Storage Project, uh, where we're partnering with uh, 174 Power Global, uh, an Irvine, California organization, uh, uh, who was going to lease uh, some vacant land where our, uh, our former uh, Charles Paletti plant had existed. And uh, uh, it's... Uh, uh, going to be 300 uh, megawatt battery storage project and uh, to uh, to store um, uh, solar and and wind energy uh, provide voltage support and uh, increase stability it's a long term lease and uh, uh, we were moving ahead but there's been some battery storage technology enhancements uh, that have to be analyzed and uh, and put in place properly for uh, for this to go forward uh, uh, I'm, I'm quite confident that will take place. It's just taking a little longer than expected. And if we could roll to the next slide, please. It's, uh, it's going to help uh, the grid resiliency. There will be job creation both uh, uh, in uh, the construction arena and uh, at the battery storage facility when it is operational and uh, up and running. Uh, uh, there will be no significant emissions or noise from uh, the construction or traffic. The, uh, the fire detection system will be uh, the state of the art uh, and uh, guided will be guided by the New York City Fire Department and with uh, project, uh, protections built into the engineering and design. Uh, and we're uh, uh, very happy to work with them. And uh, it's, uh, it's very reassuring to have them uh, guide us through this process. And, uh, and that's what we have for tonight, Richard. I appreciate oh, everybody. Thank you. Thank There's you so our much, contact information. Yeah. And okay. Anna, thank you so much. I got a quick question for you uh, in that last slide, uh, Jim. Where is which facility is the Pilates facility? It's on 20th Avenue, I believe, in 31st Street. It's next to our Eugene Zeltman plant, which is currently active. How is that in relation to the um, conversion facility that's supposed to be put up by? Uh, um, the champagne project uh i i can uh check on that and and get back to you i don't want to uh, that, i think that might be close to the same piece of land uh, i think you're near, you are near the soccer field and i think all oh, this is near the soccer field too so. probably okay um <clears throat> and what's the source of power on that is that uh where they're going to be running the um windmills in the in the uh, off the brooklyn and long island sound area well, it'll be uh, offshore wind uh, from the Atlantic Ocean, either in the Rockaways or uh, further out in the Hamptons mm -hmm. that will uh, will travel and uh, eventually be stored there for future use when it's needed. That's okay, the great thing about It's like a battery. plant battery storage. Right? I beg your pardon? It's like uh, replacing the peaker plants with... Uh, in that sense, yes. Yeah, in that sense. Eventually, yeah. mm -hmm. that's correct. Okay. I don't know if there's any other questions. If anybody has any questions, they can always reach out to us or they can reach out directly if you look on the slide to Mr. Serta or Kayla. 
Um, <clears throat> Kayla, I, I would be reaching out to you at some point and uh, um, maybe we'll talk about what we can do in the neighborhood. I really appreciate that. So. Thanks, I look forward to that. Okay. And thanks everybody Thank for joining us in the meeting tonight. Again, we're gonna be going through um, all the chat and any questions that weren't answered, we will forward them to whoever they were directed towards. And we'll uh, we'll answer try and get answers Thank for you. people. Oh, I do have one other quick question, Jim. What is the relationship between you and uh, uh, NYSERDA? NYSERDA is the people that ran the actual RFP process, right, for these different projects? That's correct. And so what, they what kind is of, your relationship? It's the New York State NYSERDA? Energy Research Development Association. So mm -hmm. they're a state agency, and obviously their mission is, is uh, to create uh, clean and renewable energy and, uh, and kind of quarterback the projects that get us there. Okay, and they're separate from you. That's correct, yes. We get confused with them. Acronyms are difficult sometimes. <laughs> we get, we get confused with NYSERDA all the time, but they're a separate entity. Mm -hmm. Good, all right. Well, good, well, thank you so much. I think this has been a really an interesting evening. I hope everybody else has found it interesting. Um, we are actually, I think, 2022 we're engaged in a new era we have new political leadership in the neighborhood we have new projects coming in we have a really an added sense of sensibility in terms of the environment which we never had before so as rough as the times have been through the uh, uh pandemic you know i'm looking for hopefully better years i hope that we all have the, uh, um, really a positive future and i hope that everybody can contribute we do have, and the biggest thing we got out of the pandemic was Zoom and StreamYard. <laughs> so yep. <laughs> we'll see how long this lasts after after people go back to work. But um, it does have its applications. So anyway, um, thanks everybody for joining us. Who's ever still here? And uh, we will see everybody next month. We haven't established a specific date yet, uh, but we will be doing a program in March. Thank you so much, Great. and good night. Thank you, Richard. Have a good night. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks so Thank much. you.